scripture reading is in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark as well. And it is the remainder of this familiar story. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When Jesus had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talithakum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May God's blessing continue to reside on the experiences of Scripture on this day. May it guide the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips. About four weeks ago, the uh, Sunday school group that meets in room 1416 started a project. They had a task. We spent four weeks delving into this text that a sermon might be molded. Now, when we started the process, I promised them they would not be preaching. Sorry, folks. You get me. But what, what we have, what we're going to experience is hopefully a faithful distillation of the fruitful conversations that we had in that classroom. And hopefully, prayerfully, it is the good news of God. And that good news begins by acknowledging that in the way that I had the scriptures read today was undoing the sandwich. took the center out. <clears throat> Sometimes when we have a really familiar text, we have to change our orientation to, to maybe hear something a little bit differently or witness something a little bit differently in it. And so that was the first task when we gathered together, was to experience this text anew and again. Well, now we need to bring it back together. Because this text is a sandwich. It's a miracle sandwich. It's the best sandwich you have ever had in your lives. And you want to have it every single day. It's that good. And to be honest, there's enough going on in this text that it should be a series of sermons. To try to bring out what God revealed in that classroom and in this text in one sermon is really, it's like trying to teach all of human history in one class. It's kind of silly. But we're going to do it anyway because that's what we do, right? We're silly sometimes. 
The text begins, the story begins for us with Jesus crossing the sea. Last week, Jesus crossed the sea going the other direction, the sea of chaos, the sea that represented creation unbridled and disordered. And now he returns across that sea again. Jesus is crossing boundaries and borders. He left the area that was home enough to go to another land, and now he is returning again, crossing the boundaries and the borders, the barriers that separate geographical, psychological, emotional, physical, whatever it may be, Jesus is crossing. And when he crosses back into the land that is home enough for now, he steps off the boat and he is greeted. When Jesus crosses boundaries, when he crosses borders, he brought the disciples with him, by the way. We've already been invited into the story. When Jesus crosses, crosses bridges, Selma comes to mind. When Jesus crosses bridges, we find that people are there to greet him. When the disciples of Christ cross bridges, both big D disciples and little d disciples cross bridges, we find that there are people there to greet in some way, shape, or form, and this individual is distraught. They are distressed. They're desperate. When Jesus crosses boundaries and barriers and bridges, when Jesus breaks through the walls of separation, whatever they may be, there are people who are distressed. And in their distressed place, they are going to reach out in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes this, this distress, this disturbance, this... Mm, Desire is not the right word anymore. This deep-seated anxiety will lead to an act of faith. It can. And faith is action. Someone reaching back out to the Jesus who crosses these barriers. This Jesus who comes into this world... God with us that can't be kept out no matter how hard we try. <clears throat> this Jesus who comes to the place where the children are laid low. And one reaches out and calls to him in desperation, desiring, desiring, And he moves into the crowd. He moves into the crowd. This Jesus who is crossing the barriers. And we know how this is. You can go into a crowd and be absolutely alone. <clears throat> you can move into a crowded space and feel like you are in a void, utterly isolated. We can be by ourselves in a room and have a cacophony of voices in our heads as well. He moves into the crowd. And in the midst of the crowd, in the crowd, as the crowd itself, there is the void. There are voids within all those who are gathered. We are invited again into the story, not just as the disciples, but we are the crowd. The people who gather together anxious and desperate and desiring, who have some kind of space within us that is disturbing the peace. A void. It's not a vacuum necessarily, although vacuums can suck things in, but no, this is just, this is a hollow. A hollow within. And there's one who is dealing with that hollow 
has been dealing with the hollow for a long time. Chronic illness wears on you. It eats away at the soul, it feels like, over time, creating a void, a hollow, and can lead to a, a desperation, an act of faith that society would not necessarily embrace. But sometimes, sometimes in the midst of the crowd, as we carry the the weight of this emptiness inside of us. There was a, a movie when I was a kid growing up that talked about the nothing. The never-ending story. Yeah. The power of this nothing within. <clears throat> and yet, in the midst of that crowd, also there is something else. There is something else that is revealed in this miracle story sandwich. Oh, mm, such a good sandwich. There is... <clears throat> power. There is the authority. There is the Spirit of God at work, and it moves, and we know it when it moves. We feel it when it moves. And suddenly, in the movement toward wholeness, and the pushing back against the nothingness, and the recreating of a world Jesus turns around and he recognizes one who had been swallowed by the crowd, one who maybe had lost a sense of identity in the void. Jesus turns around and he recognizes and he says, daughter. The power of the Spirit, God in the void. Bless you. And then he moves on. For word has come, word has come that Jesus should not be bothered anymore. This Jesus who bothered to cross the boundaries to go to the other side of the shore. This Jesus who bothered to come back again to this side. This Jesus who bothered to wade into the crowd to cross the barriers and the boundaries and the bridges that are erected to separate or that are defended to keep people out. This Jesus bothered. He bothered to notice. He bothered to respond. And so when he is told not to bother anymore, he keeps going. And he moves from the crowd space, the public sphere, into the private of the home. Now, a lot of us grew up in homes where we had this public-private space. We still might in our homes, depending. Uh, we might have grown up in an in a area where you had the front porch, right? That's where you meet people. Someone comes to your house, you meet them on the front porch. And if they're a complete stranger, you probably hang out on the porch with them. If you know them somewhat, or there may, there may be an expected guest of some kind, you'll bring them into the, the front room just off the porch, the parlor area, something along those lines. And if they're a better friend, if they're family, if something like that, you might draw them further into the house. You might even bring them all the way to the dining room table. There's an intimacy to being fed at the table. Jesus crosses boundaries. He goes from this public place into the innermost sanctum of the house. The most private dwellings. Crossing the barriers and the walls and everything else. And he goes in and he reaches down in his resurrection language. He lifts up. Calls forth. Get up. This Jesus crosses the boundaries. This Jesus who carried the disciples with him and invited them to dare to cross boundaries and borders and barriers. This Jesus who was, is, and will ever be a version of God with us, the realm that fills the void. This Jesus who calls us to be church today, 
raised her up. Restored her. Daughter. Rise up, children. And then he turned to the family. He turned to the disciples that came with him, the disciples that crossed in the boat and crossed back again, the disciples who waited through the crowd, the disciples who, in a comical moment, wanted to know why Jesus was asking who was touching him. He turned to them and said, Give her something to eat. Thanks be to God. Amen.